God's a giant saint. Not the WWF. Uh, WWF. Uh, this is Claremont, so uh, it's going to be in the white Indian tradition, I'm sure, of a dialogue. And it's going to be a dialogue between uh, Stephen Shaviro and Graham Harmon. And Stephen Shaviro is DeRoy Professor of Philosophy at Wayne State. Not English. Oh, sorry, English. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> Roy Professor at uh, uh, Wayne State University in Detroit, the author of, amongst other works, The Cinematic Body, Do Patrol, Without Criteria, and uh, Cinematic Affect. And uh, he will speak first, and he will uh, be responded to by Graham Harmon, who is uh, Professor of Philosophy and uh, Associate Provost at the American University in Cairo. Uh, he is, of course, uh, one of the representatives of speculative realism or object-oriented philosophy, and is the author of, for instance, Tool Being, Guerrilla Metaphysics, uh, The Prince of Networks, and most recently, Towards Speculative Realism. And so we begin with uh, Professor Shaviro, Stephen Shaviro, who's going to speak on consequences of panpsychism. Okay, um, I should probably begin with a couple of Apologies or mad coopers or whatever. Um, okay, so the first thing is that the reason no I mean, I haven't really finished my paper, so the only thing which consults with this fact that if I had finished, it would be way too long to, to talk in the, to, to read it, all of it in the time thing. So, what basically happens is that at the beginning of the paper is very polished and I'm very satisfied with it. As it goes along, it gets a little less polished, and by the end, it's like just these basic, you know, notes to myself what I want to say, so I'll devolve from reading word for word what I've written to loose paraphrase, which will doubtless not have either the linguistic, you know, fineness or the articulateness of argument that I'd like. Okay, so that's, but I, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, the structure of the paper is really, I start by raising the question of panpsychism, which I, why did take seriously, I think we should take seriously, even though why doesn't use that word. I then go into thinking about the relation of Whitehead to object-oriented ontology, and then I go back to try to apply these lessons to thinking about a Whiteheadian brand of panpsychism. So the other thing which I'm a little, you know, feeling a little strange about is that the way it's become, we've, Graham and I have argued before um, on several occasions. There's the book which Graham and Levi and a third person co-edited, The Speculative Turn, should be out, Graham tells me, by the end of the year, and it contains, among other things, and writings by a number of the people here present, um, my Whiteheadian critique of Graham's thought and his response. So I originally didn't want to see this as anything like that. I just wanted to talk about panpsychism, but I sort of got waylaid, partly because I really do find the formulations of object-oriented ontology even when I disagree with them, to be very helpful in or organizing my own ideas about other things. And also just because of this topic being, this conference being about metaphysics of things, and three of the four best-known object-oriented ontology people being here and giving papers, I felt that I needed to address it again. So it's become a little bit like, I don't know, um, maybe world wrestling entertainment is the best metaphor. <laughs> maybe, um, Adrian Ivakiv's blog, Imminence, he sort of called it a middleweight match, since the heavyweights are either not here or gone from this planet. So I don't know what what to think about it. But anyway, so I'll try to I'll, I'll try to you know talk about object-oriented technology, but bring it back to what I'm really interested in doing with panpsychism, and then um, I'm sure Graham will ruthlessly criticize me. What I'm really thinking about actually is that it's sort of like during the 1980s, there was this lecture tour, which was a debate between Timothy Leary, the psychedelic pioneer, and G. Gordon Liddy, the Watergate burglar. So I've started thinking about this, that um, Graham is, is sort of, with his weird realism, is sort of the Timothy Leary of philosophy. And I find myself, therefore, as kind of the G. Gordon Liddy figure. Although I'd say G. Gordon Liddy was, was, was a ferocious Nietzschean, which I would disclaim being in any sense a Nietzschean, and I can't imagine Liddy having a kind word for Whitehead, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I think myself as a Whiteheadian, so there's that difference. But basically, I'm, I'm supposed to rein him in, um, or 
whatever, and um, doubtless it is response, he'll escape again. So, anyway, okay. Consequences of panpsychism. And okay, also, I mean, as you'll see, this resonates, I mean, it's very pleased by sitting through the talks today in that so much of what I said resonates without my necessarily knowing when I wrote it with what other people said. So, um, particularly Beatrice's talk in the previous panel about rocks, I mean, as you'll see, immediately is something that I'm trying to address also. Okay. What is it like to be a rock? Rudy Rucker's science fiction story, Panpsychism Proved, provides one possible answer. A programmer at Apple named Shirley develops a new mind-link technology which allows people to directly experience each other's thoughts. When two individuals swallow microgram quantities of entangled pairs of carbon atoms, they enter into direct telepathic contact. Shirley hopes to seduce her co-worker Rick by melding their minds together. Unfortunately for her, he has other plans. She ingests a batch of entangled carbon particles, but Rick dumps his corresponding batch on a boulder. Instead of getting in touch with Rick, Shirley finds that, quote, the mind she linked to was inhuman, dense, taciturn, crystalline, serene, beautiful. She fails in her quest for deeper human contact, but finds solace through intimacy with a friendly gray lump of granite. How nice to know that a rock had a mind. Okay. Panpsychism, and I should say, I, I'm, I'm quite deliberately using panpsychism here. Others have, I for instance, David Ray Griffin argues that what Whitehead stands for is really pan-experientialism, which is I mean, he has grounds for it, but it's basically an attempt to soften the shock of panpsychism, and I don't want to soften the shock, so I'll keep with that term. Panpsychism defends the thesis that even rocks have minds. More formally, David Skirbina defines panpsychism as, quote, the view that all things have mind or a mind-like quality. Mind is seen as fundamental to the nature of existence and being, unquote. Or in the slightly different words of Thomas Nagel, who entertains the notion without fully endorsing it, panpsychism is, panpsychism is again I'm quoting, the view that the basic physical constituents of the universe have mental properties, whether or not they are parts of living organisms. Okay, so most importantly, panpsychism makes the claim that mind, or sentience of some sort, is, as Rucker claims, a universally distributed quality. Thinking happens everywhere. It extends all the way down, and all the way up for that matter. We cannot restrict mentality just to human beings, nor can we restrict it to mammals or to organisms that have nervous systems, or even to the entire animal kingdom. Rather, we must say that plants, fungi, and unicellular organisms think, and what is more, that non-living entities like stars and lumps of granite think as well. Because it makes such seemingly extravagant claims, panpsychism is easily subject to de derision and ridicule. The most common response is probably the one epitomized by the analytic philosopher Colin McGinn, who calls it, and this is a quote, a complete myth, a comforting piece of utter boulder dash. Isn't there something vaguely hippie-ish, i.e. stoned, about that doctrine? I don't know, this hippie-ish, i.e. stoned somehow got to me. Um, stoned or not, the problem is really one of extension. In his famous article, What Is It Like to Be a Bat?, Nagel argues that the fact, that, quote, the fact that an organism has conscious experience at all means basically that there is something it is like to be that organism. For Nagel, it is if it evidently like something to be a bat, even if we can never actually know or say the words just what that something is. I presume that most people will agree that it's also like something to be a dog or a cat or another familiar mammal. But how far down does what is it like this go? Does a lobster have inner qualitative experience? Does a tree? How many non-stone people will agree with Rudy Rucker that it is like something to be a rock? According to Whitehead, and this is from Inventions of Ideas, Leibniz explained what it must be like to be an atom. Lucretius tells us what an atom looks like to others, and Leibniz tells us how an atom is feeling about itself. But who today is Leibnizian or Whiteheadian enough to assert that it is indeed like something to be an atom or a neutrino? Few advocates of panpsychism expect that the doctrine could actually be verified by scientific experiment, as happens in Rucker's whimsical story. It is not really a question of getting a rock or a neutrino to speak. Even if we were able, as Whitehead once put it, to ask a stone to record its autobiography, the results would probably not be very exciting. But this does not mean that the question of what it is like to be a rock is senseless. The issue is really an ontological one. The analytic philosopher Sam Coleman, expanding Nagel's thought experiment into a foundational principle, argues that absolute what, is it, what it is likeness must lie at the heart of ontology. Following Bertrand Russell, Coleman notes that the concepts, and this is a quote, the concepts of physics only express the extrinsic natures of the items they refer to. The question of their intrinsic nature is left unanswered by the theory with its purely formal description of micro-ontology. That is to say, in my terms, contemporary physics, no less than the physics of Lucretius, just tells us what an atom looks like to others. 
describes an atom in terms of its extrinsic relational qualities, but it does not tell us what an atom actually is intrinsically for itself. And this is the gap that panpsychism seeks to fill. Of course, one can always deny, as many thinkers do, that an atom or a neutrino or a superstring or a quantum field has any such thing as an intrinsic nature at all. Some thinkers even deny this of larger entities like rocks and trees and human beings. But if we are not to indulge in such brilliant feats of explaining away, then we must be able to point to an entity's inside as well as its outside. Sam Coleman and Galen Strawson, the two analytic philosophers most strongly inclined to panpsychism, both argue that, as Coleman says, we should, must, look to consciousness to provide the intrinsic nature of any entity, even a microphysical one. The only plausible candidate for the inner being of any entity, Coleman argues, is something akin to what we know as phenomenal qualitative experience. This is why Coleman argues that what is it, what is it likeness is universal. For Strawson, if we are to accept the findings of physical science, reject dualism and idealism, and also refuse to explain away the self-evidence of experience or consciousness, then panpsychism is the only remaining alternative. And here's a quote from Strawson. All physical stuff is energy in one form or another, and all energy, I trow, is an experience involving phenomenon. So I mean, part of what I'm arguing is that Strawson and Coleman, in spite of themselves, end up sounding a lot like Whitehead, but there are also very important differences, which I'll get to later. Um, Strawson admits that this sounded crazy to me for a long time, but he firmly maintains that there is no way around it if one is to maintain a robust realism. Panpsychism uh, sounds crazy to analytic philosophers and scientific reductionists, though so this hasn't stopped a number of them from taking it seriously, as if under duress. Nonetheless, panpsychism has a long philosophical pedigree, as David Skirbin thoroughly demonstrates in his recent books on the subject. From the pre-Socratics on through Spinoza and Leibniz down to William James and Whitehead, and still today, Panpsychism has been a recurring underground motif in the history of Western thought. It persists as a kind of counter-tendency to the anthropocentrism and the hierarchical ontologies of mainstream philosophical dogmas. It offers a rebuke both to the exaggerations of various idealisms, which tend to dissolve stubborn facts, as Wade called into mind, and to the pretensions of those positivisms and reductionisms, which tend to deny mentality altogether. 20th century philosophy, with the lonely exception of Whitehead, was crippled by its obsession with overcoming or doing away with metaphysics. But today, as we emerge at last from the shadow of this obsession, it is once again possible to entertain panpsychism as a speculative proposition. The speculative realisms and new materialisms of the last several years offer us the prospect of a basic reorientation of thought. At last, we seem ready, instead of explaining things away, to pay due attention to the multitude of things in the world around us, in all their vibrancy, complexity, and autonomy from us. I want to argue that panpsychism, panpsychism has an important role to play in this process. More specifically, and in the context of this conference, I'd like to show how panpsychism, and particularly Whitehead's version of it, responds to the questions raised by the object-oriented ontology of Graham Harmon, Levi Bryant, Ian Bogost, and Timothy Morton, who's not here. As far as I can tell, OOO, as I'll call it for shorthand, offers four challenges to contemporary philosophy. Each of these involves the rejection of a commonly held post-Kantian doctrine, and the requisite, a requisite instead for the development of, a new, of new metaphysical concepts. Number one, in the first place, OOO rejects what Kenton Mayasu calls correlationism. This is the idea that, as Harmon puts it, and I quote, long quote from Harmon, we cannot think of humans without world, nor world without humans, but only have a primal rapport or correlation between the two. For the correlationist, it is impossible to speak of a world that pre-existed humans in itself, but only of a world pre-existing humans for humans, end of quote. To reject correlationism is to accept the meaningfulness of a world that exists in and for itself independently of human beings. We need to get away from the sophism that, as Harmon sarcastically summarizes it, what is thought is thereby converted entirely into thought, and that which lies outside thought must always remain unthinkable. For the whole point of philosophical speculation, I would say, is to point thought outside itself, to orient thought to that which it cannot grasp or comprehend, to reach outside what Mayasu calls the correlationist circle. In the second place, OOO rejects what Harmon calls the philosophy of human access. This is not quite the same thing as correlationism, though it is closely related, and I'll come and explain this in a moment. In this philosophy, the philosophy of human access, which has dominated Western thought, at least since human Kant, again a quote from Harmon, everything is reduced to a question of human access to the world, and non-human relations are abandoned to the natural sciences. To reject the priority of human access is therefore to recognize that non-human entities are active in themselves, and that they affect one another, even in the absence of human input or observation. All encounters between entities happen on the same ontological level. As Harmon puts it, rightly attributing this position to Whitehead, though the language is very, it's very Harmonian and un-Whiteheadian. We can speak in the same way of the relation between humans and what they see, and that between hailstones and tar. I have to ask Graham at some point why he has such a fascination with 
guitar, but <laughs> maybe we can leave that aside for now. Human understanding has no special ontological privilege. We must reject the binary opposition between human subjectivity, intellect, and initiative on the one hand, and the supposed passivity and inertness of objects or mere matter on the other. Rather, we must join Bruno Latour in seeing a world of non-human as well as human actives. In the third place, OOO rejects relationism, where the idea that every entity is entirely determined by it can be completely described in terms of its relation to other entities. For relations in this thought, there are no things, structure is all there is, which is actually a quote, not from Hegel or anybody like that, but from Ladyman and Ross, whose recent version of scientific reductionism was critiqued by Graham in a recent essay. A structure in this sense is founded upon what Manuel Delanda calls relations of interiority. The component parts are constituted by the very relations they have to other parts in the whole. A part detached from such a whole ceases to be what it is, since being this particular part is one of its constitutive properties. That's Delanda. To reject the notion of structure, as Harmon and Delanda both do, is to recognize that, as Harmon says, there can be no relations without relata. For Delanda, as for Deleuze, relations are external to their terms. <laughs> A relation may change without the terms changing, and that's Deleuze in the dialogues between Deleuze and Claire Parnay. Similarly for Harmon, objects are irreducible to their relations with other things and always hold something in reserve from these relations. There is always more to this particular tree, for instance, than is ever captured in my perception of the tree, or even in the sum total of all the perceptions of the tree by all the other entities that encounter it. This means that the tree must have an inside as well as an outside, an intrinsic nature as well as relational properties. Finally, in the fourth place, OOO rejects what Sam Coleman calls smallism, or, quote from Coleman, the view that all facts are determined by the facts about the smallest things, those existing at the lowest level of ontology, so that facts about the microphysical determine facts about the chemical, the biological, and so on. Smallism maintains that, um, as Harmon puts it, all physical things can be reduced to microparticles, so that a table will be nothing over and above the quarks and electrons of which it is made. Such a doctrine is upheld not just by hardcore physical reductionists, but by nearly all analytic philosophers, as far as I can tell, including those like Coleman who were inclined towards panpsychism. To reject smallism is to insist upon the integrity of the actuality of entities of all sizes. It is to recognize that a table is every bit as real as the microparticles of which it is composed. Harmon argues this point by citing the line as multi-level assemblage theory. Actual concrete things are always assemblages, real units made up of subpersonal components. This is Harmon citing Delanda. Instead of tortuously parsing out the alleged differences between ultimate and derived entities or between mere aggregates and true individuals, we should accept the ontological validity and the actuality of the assemblages of all sizes. Okay, what I now want to do is sort of take the challenge of these four doctrines of object or ontology and try to argue or, uh, of how Whitehead meets these challenges, which he obviously does in a very different way from how OOO meets the challenges. Okay. In the first place, I take it for granted that, as Harmon insists, Whitehead rejects the philosophy of human access. All actual entities constitute themselves by apprehending other actual entities. This process is not limited to the case of human beings endowed with a special gift of self-consciousness. What's more, all actual occasions pass through the roles of both subject and object in the course of their process. The first in their activity of concrescence, and the second when they perish and become data for other subsequent occasions. It is therefore impossible to divide the world between a group of especially privileged, rational, and sentient subjects, ourselves and an uh, undifferentiated agglomeration of supposedly mute and passive objects, everything else. More generally, for panpsychism, human access is no different in kind from the sort of whatever access any entity has to any, whatever any other entity it encounters. I began the sunlight that warms me, or the broccoli that I have for dinner, in much the same way that, to cite one of Harmon's favorite examples, fire apprehends the cotton that it consumes. Considered in such terms, access is not an epistemological quandary, but a basic matter of, a matter of basic ontology. Whether Whitehead's panpsychism actually escapes correlationism is more open to doubt. May assume himself would most likely argue that Whitehead, like Schelling, Hegel, Nietzsche, Bergson, and Deleuze, rather works by absolutizing the correlation itself. This phrase means that the philosophy in question, another quote from May assume, hypostasizes some mental, sentient, or vital term, thus continuing to endorse a variety of intentional analogy or subjectivism. For May assume it would seem that the only way out of the correlationist circle is to reject the categories of subjectivity experience altogether and adopt a stance Quote, which takes seriously the possibility that there is nothing living or willing in the inorganic realm, unquote. Such is the only way, another quote may assume has, to think a world that can dispense with thought, a world that is essentially unaffected by whether or not anyone thinks it. And this radical purgation of thought from being can only be accomplished, may assume says, through the mathematization of nature, by means of which physical science indubitably allows us, he says, quote, to know what may be while we are not, unquote. 
In this way, Mayasu's critique of correlationism with insistence upon a reality that is totally asubjective stands at the opposite extreme from the panpsychist claim that thought or experience is an imminent attribute of all entities. But is eliminating thought from the universe of things really the price we must pay to in order to escape correlationism? For Mayasu and also for Ray Brassier, the answer would seem to be yes. It's only through mathematization, as Mayasu says, following that to you, or through a radical limitivism, as Brassier draws on, that we can overcome the otherwise unchallenged assumption that, as Brassier says, objective reality must be transcendently guaranteed. OO, however, offers a somewhat less stringent criterion for getting out of correlations. And Levi Bryant suggests that we do not need to entirely abandon transcendental arguments since the independence of objects is in fact secured by the inverted transcendental argument of Roy Baskar's critical realism. For his part, Harmon proposes a metaphor that metaphor and other forms of illusion allow us to refer to things that lie outside of our own thought without thereby transforming into them into objects of thought. For the object of illusion, Harmon says, is always a unified thing apart from the, no the knowable features of it. That is to say, the object of an illusion is something that is designated without actually being grasped. We are therefore able to positively affirm its existence without thereby positing it as an object for our thought. And this, I believe, is entirely congruent with Whitehead's point that in any act of apprehending things in the world, what is thereby realized in the apprehension is apprehension, not the things. This unity of apprehension defines itself as a here and a now, and the things so gathered into the grasped unity have essential reference to other places and other times. Therefore, and this is from Science of the Modern World, it is only aspects of the things over there which are grasped into unity here. So, I, again, this, this is complicated, and I mean when I finish the essay to go back to it, because that's one side of, of Whitehead's argument. The other side of Whitehead's argument is that other things are really pre present in the thing that prehends them, which is equally important, and is balancing those two is, is, is what you need to get a fuller sense of what Whitehead's saying, but I'll leave that aside for now. When we realize the existence of things in the world, we thereby also affirm their independence from us. Um, okay, so, so that in that sense, I think you'd say that Whitehead, like OO, is non-correlationist. The third requisite of OO, the rejection of constitutive relations, is one where Harmon at least finds Whitehead wanting. Harmon defends both Whitehead and Latour from the charge of correlationism, but he still finds them guilty of the broader charge of relationism. However, I think the problem here is that relationism can have several distinct meanings. As I've already noted, OO's critique of relationism is really directed against what Delanda calls relations of interiority, like the Hegelian dialectic or Saussure's synchronic structure of differences without positive terms. But the same does not necessarily apply to what Delanda calls external relations, which are only, he says, contingently obligatory. In such cases, Delanda follows William James and Deleuze in seeing a continual fluorescence of external relations. Such relations do not exhaust or definitively determine the terms to which they apply. But James argues that what he calls conjunctive relations are as real as anything else. The continuities and the discontinuities are absolutely coordinate matters of immediate feeling. The conjunctions are as primary elements of fact as are the distinctions and disjunctions. That's from essays in radical empiricism. This means that external relations are perfectly real in and of themselves, as much so as the terms to which they partially, which they partially place in relation. A relation is a concrete happening or an event. And to the extent that it persists in time, it is a thing, in the same way that any persisting physical object is a thing. Harmon himself accepts this point, at least to the limited extent that he says that any relation between objects itself constitutes a new sort of object. Now, given this view of external relations and their existence as things in their own right, Whitehead entirely agrees with OOO that terms can never be fully determined by their relations. A given term can always disentangle itself from some relations and enter into other relations instead. But at the same time, and this is where Whitehead differs from Harmon, no term for Whitehead can ever disentangle itself from all relations and subsist entirely by itself. I can disentangle myself from the atmosphere by isolating myself in a pressure-resistant bubble and breathing oxygen from a canister instead, but deprive me altogether of my relation to oxygen and I die. This means that I cease to exist as a thing or as a term in it for any relations whatsoever. But after my death, my body persists as a thing. It interacts or enters into relations with the bacteria that dissolve and eat it, for instance. Of course, this can be avoided by cremating my remains and sending the ashes into the depths of interstellar space. But even there, the dust that is derived by a historic root of actual occasions from the living flesh that I once was will still be affected by cosmic radiation and will be subject to the fluctuations of the quantum fields that pervade even empty space. In general, Whitehead's claim is therefore that, on the one hand, every change in relations transforms the term into something different from what it was before. This is inevitable because every change in relations is an event involving an encounter that has never before taken place in quite the same way, so it introduces something new into the universe. But on the other hand, contra radical relationism, this change in relations only influences the nature of the term and can never determine it altogether. 
There's always some scope for the term's own decision to how it responds to the change in relations that supervenes upon it. We might in this way oppose the Whiteheadian doctrine of underdetermination to Althusser's notion of overdetermination. A thing is underdetermined by its relations. It's never free of them, but also retains a certain capacity to resist them, to alter and combine them in various ways, and to select among them. And this is always a matter of degree. Much of the time, a change in relations is minor or trivial enough, why they would say negligible, that we speak the continuity of the thing that is the term of the relation. Thus, my trip earlier this week from Detroit to Claremont has only made a negligible difference in who and what I am. So I basically say I'm still the same person, more or less. But at other times, the change in relations is greater, and we'll be led to speak either of metamorphosis, when, the cal when that's when a caterpillar becomes a butterfly, or of breakdown, when my dead body is, because my dead body is a very different sort of thing than I was when I was alive. In this sense, Whitehead does meet the third requisite of OOO, that no entity can ever be entirely defined and circumscribed by even the totality of its relations. But he also insists in contradiction, at least to Harmon's version of OOO, that no entity can ever be withdrawn from contact or independent of all relations whatsoever. And this is why panpsychism is necessary. To be a thing in the world is to be engaged in relations, but it's also to exist above and apart from all these relations. Whitehead's cosmology is grounded in what he calls the antithesis between publicity and privacy. This antithesis necessarily runs through everything, for there can be no bifurcation of actualities. That is to say, there is no categorical separation between public objects and private objects, for the simple reason that every actual entity is necessarily both. And this is also something, also something which has become clear for me, I, I think, from, from Graham's writing, because his criticism of various people, including Heidegger, is always that Heidegger says that a certain ontological relation applies to a specific being who is privileged relation to it, and in fact that this is wrong, and that if the ontological categorizes validity, it's be a sort of all organisms. So anyway, getting back to Whitehead. Whitehead says, an actual entity considered in reference to the privacy of things as a subject, namely it is a moment in the genesis of self-enjoyment. But at the same time, the very same actual entity considered in reference to the publicity of things as a superject, namely it arises from the publicity which it finds and it adds itself to the publicity which it transmits. By its public side or its outside, the entity encounters and enters into a relation with a plethora of other entities. By its private side or its inside, the entity feels all these relations and constitutes itself, attaining self-enjoyment, by making a decision about how to respond to them. The inner experience of an entity, Whitehead says, may or may not involve consciousness. It may or may not involve judgment. But in any case, it will involve aversion or adversion. That is to say, decision." End quote. And this decision is, in its own right, the psychism that panpsychism says is essential to every last thing in the universe, from God to the most trivial puff of existence in far fifty space. Decision is the way that an atom or any other thing in the world is feeling about itself. In the privacy of its decision or in its mentality, an actual entity always exists in and for itself, apart from all the other entities with which it is contemporaneous. Indeed, for Whitehead, it is the definition of, contempor of contemporary events that they happen in causal independence of each other. I suggest that this is the source, but also the extent of what OOO sees as the withdrawal of objects from one another. For Whitehead, another quote from him, Adventures of Ideas. The vast causal independence of contemporary occasions is the preservative of the elbow room within the universe. It provides each actuality with a welcome environment for irresponsibility. Um, I, I just love that quote. And anyway, things are withdrawn, therefore, to the extent they are able to be irresponsible. And this also means to the extent they are able to think. As Whitehouse says in the same a few pages, on the same page actually, Am I my brother's keeper? expresses one of the earliest gestures of self consciousness. Indeed, a few pages later, the causal independence of contemporary occasions is the ground for freedom within the universe. The claim of panpsychism is precisely that all beings have this freedom, at least to a certain extent. Isabel Stengers has taught us, in the course of her reading of Whitehead, that the construction of metaphysical concepts always addresses certain particular situated needs. The concepts that a philosopher produces depend upon the problems to which he or she is responding. Every thinker is motivated by the difficulties that cry out to him or to her, demanding response. A philosophy, therefore, defines itself by the nature of its accomplishments by which it is able to disclose, produce, or achieve. By what it is able to disclose, produce, or achieve. For Harmon, the urgent task for philosophy is to account for how two entities, isolated as they are from one another, can ever possibly enter into contact. How could objects, locked away in their lonely prisons, withdrawn between their firewalls, ever reach out into the larger world at all? Harmon develops a whole theory of vicarious causation, reviving the ancient doctrine of occasionalism, in order to give an answer to this question. That is to say, for Harmon, the general situation of the world is one of objects isolated in their vacuums, and any connection or communication between one object and another across the lonely void is an extraordinary, fragile, and contingent achievement. But my own metaphysical problem is just the opposite of this. And, you know, this, I mean, I think I suggested in an earlier 
in an earlier article that the differences I see here are ultimately aesthetic, and this is kind of an expansion of that. I, I feel that our condition is one of ubiquitous connection. We're continually beset by relations, smothered and suffocated by them. We are always threatened by overdetermination. Today we are beset by the overcoatings of the ubiquitous flows of capital, as well as by the demands that all the entities we encounter impose upon us, the claims that they make for our attention, which is unceasing. Far from seeing any metaphysical problem of occasionalism or vicarious causation, I can only wish that some of the causations that continually beset me were indeed vicarious and occasional, instead of being so overbearingly efficacious. For me, then, there's no problem of causality. The great metaphysical problem is how to get away from these ubiquitous relations, at least in part, in order to find a tiny bit of breathing room. And indeed, I should mention, this was the theme of my book, Connected, or What It Means to Live in the Network Society, which I wrote, finished writing, before I ever encountered Whitehead. It is only by escaping from these overdetermined relations, from finding a space that is open for decision, that I may ever hope to find either adventure or peace, to name the two highest values that are the titles of the last two chapters of Adventures of Ideas. So to my mind, relation and causal determination is a common condition of malady. And self-creation or independence is a rare, fragile, and extraordinary achievement that needs to be cultivated and cherished. Now, I hope Graham will forgive me for saying that I think that Whitehead is ultimately more balanced than either him, him than either Graham is, or than I myself am. Um, Whitehead understands the need for both relation and separation. His metaphysics posits both of these as equally critical, crucial requisites. Indeed, Whitehead makes both relation and separation into notions that were altogether generic. Every entity in the world, he suggests to us, has both privacy and publicity, both an inside and an outside. This means that both sides of the process, the beneficent, the widening of relationships in circles of concern, which can be beneficent, despite my panic about it, on the one hand, and the absolute self-enjoyment of the individual entity on the other hand, both of these happen at every moment and form part of every occasion, and aren't, they aren't the kind of big deal I've just been making of them. The achievements either of community or self-affirmation are often quite modest, but they are common rather than rare. My own predilections lead me in the direction of melodramatic exaggeration and apocalyptic despair. And this is why I continually require Whitehead's gentle admonishment that for every generalization, the estimation of success is exaggerated. I exaggerate too much, and Whitehead always reminds me of this. And more generally, it's important for me to be able to realize, thanks to Whitehead, that there is some small room for decision, and therefore, thereby for novelty in every entity's process of concrescence. Um, so, I'm going to try to summarize now because I'm afraid of taking too long. I go on to talk about the fourth requisite, which is um, the critique of smallism. And my argument here, which I still haven't completely worked out, which is why I'm not going to read this verbatim, is that um, in a certain sense, Whitehead departs from the flat, what, oh, what both Manuel Delanda and Levi Bryant call flat ontology, in the sense that he does have two levels of being, because they have the actual entities or actual occasions on the one hand, and societies. Which, are the, which is what we experience in everyday life, on the other hand. So and you might say it's a two-floor ontology, but I think the important point here is that it's not, it's not a reductionist one. In other words, unlike the analytic philosophers who, in fact, base their whole argument, the analytic philosophers I mentioned at the beginning who, who do advocate panpsychism, base their own whole argument for panpsychism on the basis that everything is reducible to its ultimate constituents. And that's why these constituents must have mentality, because it couldn't have come from anywhere else. And it's Coleman, who himself says, if you, if you abandon smallism, then the whole argument falls apart. Obviously, I'm suggesting that there are other Whiteheadian grounds for thinking about panpsychism. And part of this is because I think Whitehead devises a way in which societies are derivative of actual occasions, and they're composed of a multiplicity spread over space and time of actual occasions. But they're, they do so in a way that I'm not satisfied saying that they have emergent property, pro properties. That just doesn't seem quite, that, that sort of in the neighborhood doesn't seem quite correct to me. So I'm still searching for how I would describe this. But anyway, you can't, I mean, Whitehead would never say that, I mean, just as he would never say that the, sun, the sunset is less real than the, than the, than the new electromagnetic radiation which the scientist sees is made of, he doesn't have actual occasions function like you know, quarks and photons. Every the table is made of, is a series or a society of actual occasions. But you cannot decompose the table or de make the tables less real in the actual occasions in the way that the scientist tries to say that the beauty of the sunset is less real than the electromagnetic radiation. So, in this sense, and I think this has some connection to what Latour called well, Latour's principle of irreduction. So this is what I'm still trying to work out. But I mean, in this sense, I think 
Whitehead answers the fourth requisite of OOO, which is the rejection of small sum. Now, to conclude quickly, which was originally what was going to originally be the main focus of my paper, which is still largely unwritten, and therefore I'll try to summarize it very quickly in three minutes. Um, where does this all leave the question of panpsychism? And my argument is that it, there, if we think of panpsychism in Whitehead's way, as opposed to in the analytic philosopher way, and in the light of the distinctions I've just drawn with the help of OOO, I think there are a couple of things we can say. In the first place, um, there's a question of what it means to say, to assert panpsychism, or to assert that all, 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 all things think. I mean, you know, Descartes says, I am a thing that thinks. Um, so in a way of saying that all things, everything is a thing that thinks. But what, what does thought actually mean? And most versions of panpsychism see this in terms of cognition or computation or something like that. I think Whitehead sort of suggests to us that we have to think of feeling as something which is primordial and prior to cognition or consciousness. So I don't think Whitehead is saying, I mean, again, Rudy Rucker says everything is computation, computation equals consciousness, and therefore that's why the story I began with, the rock is conscious. I'm not sure Whitehead says the rock is, or, the, or a quark or a neutrino is conscious. He says that it is that it has feeling. And I think part of the argument here is that more quote-unquote advanced mental states um, derived from feeling, and the analytic supporters of panpsychism worry that if you don't have the ultimate atomic entities, ultimate subatomic entities being conscious, and you don't have a genesis of conscious, I think consciousness, I think Whitehead's idea of societies gives us a beginning towards how we might think of a genesis of more complex modes of thought from the more basic modes of thought, which are, so I mean, again, going back to the discussion after the previous panel, it's not that Whitehead's, Whitehead, Whitehead's ontologically saying human beings and rocks are equal, but he's not saying that rocks are as articulate or conscious as we think of ourselves as being. Okay, and then there's a lot of other stuff here. I mean, there's a lot of inf about decision in biology and so on and so forth. Um, but the second thing to end is that um, if we see that if we see that this, this kind of feeling and the apprehension of data and, re and response to a decision is made about those data is what's primordial and what is the basic panpsychist thesis or the basic nature of all beings or all things, um, then that might cause us to rethink the centrality of certain, of, of certain doctrines of life. And here, um, here I'll express my disagreement with Michael Austin's neo-vitalism, even though I greatly admired his paper, in the sense that I think Whitehead, I'm not sure about other, I'm not sure about whether you can call Bergson or Deleuze vitalist or not, but I think Whitehead is not a vitalist because he talks about life in a very different way from which he talks about the fact that all entities have mental poles and that they for all things all societies have some kind of feeling. Um, and in other words, it's not because something's alive or has conatus or whatever that it therefore thinks. It's because things think because they have affectivity as a basic form of thought that therefore some of them can turn out to be alive. And secondly, what that means when things are alive, I mean the distinction is that the originality or novelty of of non-living things, what it says, tend to be fairly negligible, though he insists there's always something there. Um, living things are, con are, are described by the greater degree of novelty, or the greater degree of searching for novelty. So rather than having conatus, or desire to maintain itself in being, um, I think that living things are characterized by their greater desire not to just maintain themselves in being, but be competent, but to transform themselves, to metamorphose, to become different. And again, this is, I think, I need to work this out a lot more to my own satisfaction. But to finally conclude, I know I've been saying concluding for a while, to, to totally conclude, I'll end as I began by citing several science fiction texts, which I think help us think about this problem. Um, one is Peter Watts' novel Blind Sight, which suggests it's an alien encounter novel in which we human beings um, encounter an alien race from another solar system which has higher cognitive achievements than we do, but which turns out not to be conscious at all. So it's a kind of playing with the kind of philosophical idea, which is analytic philosophical idea of zombies, or people who would do everything outwardly that a conscious person would do, but in fact aren't conscious. And he kind of literalizes this, and actually, well, I, mean, I could go, there's a lot of things to say about this. I mean, this is not, a, I'm not sure, Watts is kind of a hardcore kind of neo-Darwinist, I'm not sure this is his reading, but my reading of the novel is that what actually comes out is the only difference you could possibly understand 
get between these non-conscious aliens and ourselves is that the non-conscious aliens have no feeling for aesthetics. Um, and in the novel, and I think, you know, again, I would want to relate this to my sense that Whitey claims that all entities do in fact have some kind of sense of aesthetics, but that, again, the development of an aesthetic sensibility has something to do with the development of consciousness and self-consciousness and so on and so forth. The other, the other recent science fiction work which I mentioned is Ted Chang's recently developed a life cycle of software objects, which is a very beautiful thing about, I'd say, affectivity and intelligence without life. It's about, so it's about a company which makes software entities, which in a certain, which are certainly not alive, but in a certain sense have a certain intelligence. They learn, they seem self-conscious, and so on and so forth. And the various things which happen when their existence and the sense that the programmers have of the need to continue to nurture this existence as a kind of basic responsibility, you know, moral responsibility, butts up against the way in which the economic imperatives of software manufacture sort of make this very difficult to maintain. And I mean, it's again, it's, it requires a lengthy commentary, but it's a very, I think, powerful and beautiful story about affectivity, something about affectivity as thought in entities or beings or things which are not alive. So I'll end there. Thanks. Does it work? Yeah. Well, we'll go straight to uh, Graham Harmon's paper, which is called, uh, you'll be able to know, another response to Shabiru. <laughs> which out of context might seem a little strange because the first one has not been published yet. In the speculative turn, I do have an article called Response to Shaviro, and I just changed the title to another Response to Shaviro for this paper this morning, which I think is simply the inverse of what Stephen was talking about, which is that he was not planning to talk about me and Triple O, uh, and yet he was sucked back into it, just as I was, I found. I was not a, planning to write about him, and, and that's what Delana calls an attractor. Try to escape it, you couldn't suck back around and walk it around. So, another response to Shaviro. In Edgar Allan Poe's short story, William Wilson, the title character is stalked and haunted by a character of the same name who undermines his efforts wherever he travels. Though we only see a few direct examples of this behavior, the narrator alludes to a host of others in rapid succession, speaking of the other Wilson as follows. Scarcely had I set foot in Paris ere I had fresh evidence of the detestable interest taken by this Wilson in my concerns. Villain, at Rome, he stepped in between me and my ambition. At Vienna, too, at Berlin and at Moscow. Where, in truth, had I not better cause the curse him within my heart? My admonisher at Eton, the destroyer of my honor at Oxford, he who thwarted my ambition at Rome, my revenge in Paris, my passionate love in Naples, or what he falsely termed my avarice in Egypt. <laughs> in my own life, a similar role was played by Stephen Shaviro. <laughs> While my activities in Egypt have so far been unobstructed by Shaviro's interference, <laughs> he has already thwarted my ambition to various degrees in Berkeley and Atlanta and the potential utopia of the blogosphere and now in Claremont. <laughs> my talk tonight will surely do nothing to end our friendly quarrel stretching across the years, but will merely serve as the latest installment in a tale whose dramatic climax may come a decade or more in the future, if ever. <laughs> Although I did not see Stephen's current paper ahead of time, he signaled most of its contents in an interesting blog post made within the past week. The thoughts that follow are formed in response both to his explicit words in that post and to related notions not openly given but hinted or insinuated. <laughs> As Stephen puts it, in the course of writing the paper for Claremont, I cannot help coming back to my agreements and disagreements with Triple O, object oriented ontology. What I find value, valuable and inspiring about Triple O are the questions it asks, which I think are necessary and important ones rather than its particular answers to these questions, which I don't accept. Here Stephen is speaking about object-oriented ontology, of which all three founding members are present at this conference. But last night, there was also more extensive discussion of speculative realism than expected in this very room, and object-oriented ontology might be treated as a subspecies of speculative realism. In order that no newcomers to these topics in the room feel excluded from the discussion, allow me to give a brief explanation of both speculative realism and object-oriented ontology before returning to Stephen's mixed appreciation and critique of Triple O, which stalked me across the globe. <laughs> Speculative realism was born from a frustration with the reigning discourse in continental philosophy, which was excessively focused on human matters long before the rise of postmodernism. Realist positions have always been an option in analytic philosophy circles. But in the continental tradition of the past hundred years, the dispute between realism and anti-realism has been viewed ever since Husserl and Heidegger as a supposed pseudo-problem more deserving of a sneer than of being posed. 
To my knowledge, it was not until 2002 that we saw any continental philosophers say, I am a realist, without self-reflexive irony, sarcastic smirks, fingers crossed behind their backs, or such extensive redefinition of the term realism that it lost its simple and literal meaning, the existence of realities independent from the minds. The traditional opposite of realism is idealism, meaning in its strictest form that nothing exists independently of the minds. But almost no one openly defends full-blown idealism these days. The disciples of Berkeley are few in number, even if thousands are amused by his claims. The more sophisticated maneuver is to say that the choice between realism and idealism is a pseudo-problem. There is neither subject nor object in isolation from one another, but only a primordial correlation or rapport between the two. The subject intends objects outside itself. Human beings are always already immersed in a world or embodied in a rich, lived texture of experience or inextricably intertwined in material conditions or what have you. In many circles, this is still viewed as a major philosophical advance over so the supposedly crusty reactionary question as to whether or not there is a world autonomous from the mind. Enter Après la Finitude, the 2006 debut book of young French philosopher Quentin Nassou. For some months, Ray Brassier had vaguely dreamed of joining me and Ian Hamilton Grant in Bristol in a joint event defending various realist positions. But it was really Mayasu's book that served as the catalyst for the inaugural 2007 speculative realist event at Goldsmiths College, University of London. Michael Halewood was in attendance and can verify for any skeptics that the event actually happened. <laughs> it's important to note that neither Brassier nor Grant nor I ever accepted even 20% of the findings of Mayasu's philosophy, intriguing though it is. What was most important for all of us was his chief polemical term, correlationism. It was necessary that this term be invented. As already stated, almost no one will admit to being a full-blown Barclayan idealist. Everyone thinks themselves beyond this problem by holding that what is primary is the correlation between human and worlds, their complete inseparability from one another. But this solution is not as usual as it sounds. As Richard Rorty put it, in remarks buried but then discovered in the archives of UC Irvine, and I thank Ian for telling me this, uh, every decade or so, someone writes a book with a title something like Beyond Realism and Idealism. And it always turns out that what's beyond realism and idealism is idealism. <laughs> <laughs> to speak only of two of my personal favorite philosophers, Husserl's intentional objects never free us from the prison of consciousness. Intentionality means imminent objectivity for both Brentano and Husserl, after all. As for Heidegger, however deep and hidden Zion is in comparison with Dasein, it is always a drama with Zion and Dasein as the only two characters. The causal interaction between raindrops and mountains would be viewed as a laughable theme by Heidegger, a topic fit only for scientists that do not think. The four original spe speculative realist philosophies and their various offshoots have almost nothing in common aside from this critique of correlationism in favor of some form of reality autonomous from humans. It was realism insofar as it endorsed the autonomous existence of things outside the correlational circle. It was speculative realism insofar as it did not ratify the biases of common sense. All four original members ended up with rather strange theories of the real. As I've written elsewhere, the usual view is that realism is the philosophy as health inspectors are to restaurants. Realism is a boring, unimaginative, dull, middle-aged philosophy that warns wild, speculative children not to stumble into rocks or chairs or overdraw their bank accounts. If mainstream realism is from Saturn, speculative realism is from Jupiter and wishes to encourage the most wildly speculative theses about the cosmos. This is something all four of us had in common in the original group, and we also shared an abhorrence for correlationism, but we shared little else. This is the main reason the group broke into fragments in less than two years, despite a considerable degree of early success. It was always a very big tent, perhaps too big, however modest its number of adherents. The label lives on as a vaguely useful rallying cry, especially in the blogosphere and especially among the young, where speculative realism remains popular. But that's also the briefly an object-oriented philosophy, which not only still exists, but even held its second conference two days ago at UCLA, watched by thousands around the world by a streaming video. Triple O, as it is now known thanks to Levi Bryant, is both the offshoot and the older brother of speculative realism, which had predated by nearly a decade. For 10 years, from the ages of 19 to 29, I resided in the philosophy of Heidegger as if in a prison. Of the two authors who freed me from this prison, and neither of them was the wonderful Bruno Latour, whom I first read shortly thereafter, one was Whitehead, and the other was the neglected Spanish Basque philosopher, the former Heidegger student Javier Zubiri, whose major book, On Essence, can be obtained in both English and French translation. Each of these authors depart from Heidegger in one radical way that allowed the object or position to emerge. Before I say what these radical departures are, let's go back to correlationism for one moment. If we compare the object oriented position with that of Mayasu, we find that the two do not even agree about what is wrong with correlations. And this was already reflected in last night's questions after the very useful Donna Haraway Isabel Stenger session, 
When Nathan Brown identified speculative realism with a claim to absolute knowledge, and Levi Bryant quickly denied it. For if we look at Kantian philosophy as the root of correlationism, we find that it has at least two separate essential features. First, Kant places the human world relation at the center of philosophy, such that any relation between two inanimate things has meaning only insofar as it is manifest to humans. And second, Kant says that the things in themselves can only be thought, not known. In short, the two central features of correlationism are A, the priority of the human world relation over all others, and B, the finitude of human knowledge. What is interesting is that Mayer who rejects B but preserves A, while object-oriented ontology rejects A but preserves B. That is to say, Mayer <coughs> obsession is finding some way to bring back absolute knowledge, the ability to exhaustively know a thing. He doesn't mind at all if the human world relation retains priority in philosophy. In fact, Mayer praises the correlationist argument as brilliance and is very difficult to overcome. If we attempt to think something outside thought, we are thinking it, and it thereby becomes a thought. Mayasu finds this argument to be as powerful as I find it to be incredibly feeble. Unlike Mayasu, the object-oriented position rejects the idea that the human world relation has some sort of special privilege over all others. This is, of course, the Whiteheadian element in object-oriented philosophy, and Whitehead was, in fact, the impetus for this departure from Heidegger, at least for me. Philosophy is no longer just a matter of sign and Dasein, but of all actual entities and all apprehensions whatsoever. Instead of a dithering meditation on the internal conditions of human cognitive and practical access to the world, we have a full-blown speculative philosophy in which all entities are superstars, not just the slaves and serfs of a pampered human subject throwing tantrums in its playroom. And Stephen Chivere was with me here. He fully enjoys the way any inside of Triple O, which is presumably the side that got me, Ian, and Levi invited to Claremont in the first place. <laughs> this is something we genuinely have in common with most of the people in this room, I believe a concern to reverse the part of Kant's Copernican revolution that removes all relations from philosophy other than the monotonous human world relations enslaved forever to the same recurrent space, time, and categories of Kant. But the other side of Triple O is the superior inspired side, and in the eyes of many people in this room, certainly in Stephen Shaviro's eyes, this will be our dark side, our lurking criminal nightlife that may make us look like a menace to speculative philosophy. Let us briefly consider Heidegger's famous tool analysis, which against all odds is what made me a realist in the first place. Against Husserl's injunction to describe entities solely as they appear, Heidegger notes that for the most part, entities do not appear. For the most part, they are silently taken for granted. The floor and oxygen in this room, the English grammar that you and I all skillfully grasp during this lecture without a second thought. For the most part, these things are noticed only if they fail in some way. Conscious perceptual or theoretical access to things is a fairly rare form of our dealings with them. This is often read as meaning that Heidegger places praxis before theory, so that all explicit awareness emerges from a hidden background of unthematized social practices. But this pragmatist interpretation of Heidegger is simply false. The reason it is false is because practices do not exhaust the things any more than theory does. Whether I make theories about hammers or simply use them, in both cases there is a lot more to the hammer than my interaction with it is able to fathom. The hammer is withdrawn from praxis no less than from theory. All of the fashionable philosophies and eminence these days which universally ignore this fact of withdrawal are therefore a bad idea, in my opinion. So, all objects withdraw from explicit human consciousness and from unconscious human practice. Some might even concede, with me, that they are veiled from animals as well. But it is necessary to go even a step further and say that this happens in the sphere of inanimate reality. When fire burns cotton, the fire does not make contact with the full reality of that cotton. The exact hue and odor of the cotton, perhaps even its exact granular texture, are of no significance at all to the fire. In principle, fans of Whitehead ought to like this globalization of relations in comparison with the cramped Heideggerian district where Dasein alone needs sign. But in practice, there will be much skepticism toward the notion of realities deeper than any possible relations, despite Stephen Chavero's intermittent claims to the contrary. We'll shift our attention back to Stephen in a moment. But the two aforementioned brands of speculative realism differ as follows. Mayasu continues to utilize the human world correlate as at least the starting point of philosophy, but he dumps Kantian finitude in favor of an absolute knowledge of things. The object-oriented position, by contrast, views the human world relation as one among trillions of others, but retrain, retains Kantian finitude while splintering it into trillions of pieces so that all entities can now enjoy the inaccessibility of the Dinanzi. Let us warmly welcome all trees, chairs, neutrons, armies, diamonds, and microbes to the world of unfulfilled <coughs> desire where humans have long labored in miserable solitude. Which brings us again to Stephen Shaviro, my eternal nemesis and tormentor. <laughs> to repeat, I did not see Stephen's actual paper ahead of time, so I am responding to its rough draft incarnation in a post made within the past week on his refreshing blog, the Pinocchio Theory. There he summarizes four challenges, and they were in his paper tonight, I'm glad to say, made by object oriented ontology to commonly held post Kantian documents, as he puts it. The point of his summarizing them is to claim that Whitehead has already addressed all four. 
While the object oriented theorists in this room are half satisfied with Whitehead, and enthusiastically so, Stephen thinks we should be entirely satisfied. If he is correct, then we ought to close up shop and reformulate our views as variants of process philosophy. Far worse fates are imaginable, but I happen to think that Stephen is wrong on this point. In any case, what he sees as the four basic challenges posed by Triple O are as follows. One, we reject what Mengesu calls correlationism. Two, we reject what I have called the philosophy of access. Three, we reject relationism, relationalism, which Stephen clearly defines as the idea that every entity is entirely determined by and can be completely described in terms of its relations to other entities. Four, we reject what Sam Coleman beautifully terms smallism, or the view that all facts are determined by the facts about the smallest things, those existing at the lowest level of ontology, so that facts about the microphysical determine facts about the chemical, the biological, and so on. Let me first simplify this list by reducing the four to three. Although Stephen is generous in claiming that my term philosophy of access is somewhat different from Mayus's correlationism, I actually see my own older term as an inferior version of Mayus's words. It is true that most post-Kantian continental philosophy remains obsessed with human access to the world rather than the world itself, but the term philosophy of access still leaves open the door for, say, a Lusserlian to respond that I'm not just concerned about access since we are, we are always already outside ourselves in a rich world of phenomena and so forth. And while I still love Husserl, this sort of lukewarm idealism is not one of the things I love about him. By contrast, Mayasu's term correlationism is far superior since it is not only crisper, snappier, and more memorable, it also leaves its target no escape. It fully grants that the correlationist is not an idealist in the strict sense, but is obsessed instead with a correlation that includes a world pole no less than a mind pole. And it holds that such a correlate is still not good enough to do justice to reality. So in fact, unless I am being absent-mindedly unfair to myself, I think Mayasu's term correlationism can simply replace my own philosophy of access, which in fact I abandoned immediately after reading his book for the first time in April 2006. Now that leaves three <coughs> challenges posed by Triple O. One, anti-correlationism. Two, anti-relationism, and three, anti-smallism, a term that I like. As Stephen notes, we all agree that Whitehead is an anti-correlationist. This is the most obviously refresh refreshing feature of this philosophy for anyone used to the bleak humanoid landscape of post-Kantian philosophy, whose vast stretches of apocalyptic rubble were supposed to be of interest only insofar as they appear to humans. There's no purpose debating point one then, since Stephen and I and Whitehead himself all agree on it. That leaves us with just two possible points of dispute, anti-relationism and anti-smallism. And here Stephen and I do have disagreements, but the reason for them is different in each case. Let's begin with anti-relationism, or anti-relationalism as he calls it. All of the object-oriented theories, including mine, insist that the object must have autonomous reality apart from all relations. And in fact, we are suspicious of both Whitehead and Bruno Latour, who is generally one of our heroes, for analyzing things into their relations. For reasons given in connection already with Heidegger's tool of analysis, I have already said that entities must be non-relational. However unfashionable this view may now seem, it is after all the trademark doctrine and the sine qua non of the object-oriented branch of speculative realism. In response, Stephen tries a mixed strategy that is not even as faithful to Whitehead as he seems to hold. In the matter of relations, Stephen quotes me accurately as saying that objects are irreducible to their relations with other things and always hold something in reserve from these relations. As he correctly comments, this means that there is always more to this particular tree, for instance, than is ever captured in my perception of the tree, or even in the sum total of all the perceptions of the tree by all the other entities that encounter it. This means that the tree must have an inside as well as an outside, an intrinsic nature as well as relational properties. Stephen's unique approach to the problem is as follows. He now holds, and this actually seems somewhat different from his earlier position in the book to be published, that entities must be autonomous from internal relations, but must nonetheless always be involved in external relations. As he puts it, in his recent blog post, it seems to me that Graham's and Levi's anti-relationalism is entirely correct when it is a question of what Manuel Delanda calls relations of interiority, in which a closed totality absolutely determines all its parts. Although I welcome the first half of this sentence, I do not see how Stephen can ground it in Whitehead's own views. Page 59 of Process and Reality, which is so relentless that my marginal notes give it the nickname the anti-substance page, begins with the following remark by Whitehead. John Locke misses one essential doctrine, namely that the doctrine of internal relations makes it impossible to attribute change to any actual entity. Every actual entity is what it is, and is with its definite status in the universe, determined by its internal relations to other actual entities. In other words, it is clear as can be that Whitehead is a theorist of internal relations, and in this respect it is perhaps irrelevant when Stephen insists that the inter interiority of any entity is constituted by the privacy of subjective aim. That is not enough privacy to satisfy me, at least, since along with saying that every actual entity is determined by its internal relations to other actual entities, Whitehead makes numerous similar statements 
as when he says that the continuum is present in each actual entity, and each actual entity pervades the continuum, or when he defines satisfaction as an evaporation of an determination, so that there is nothing left to limit actual entity's privacy over and above its prohensions. Otherwise, it would be a so-called vacuous actuality. If Stephen wants to say that an entity is free from internal relations, but enmeshed in a constant efflorescence of external relations, this is not quite a way heady imposition. It may be compatible with James and Deleuze, as he says, but it would also be compatible with object-oriented philosophies that are less extreme than my own. For while Stephen says that no term can ever disentangle itself from all relations, this is simply impossible, I hold that it is not only possible, but actually quite common. Certainly no entity can be free of internal composition. And in this sense, an object emerges from the misty wastes of its component pieces. These domestic relations, as I call them, are not the same, same thing as the foreign relations from which a thing is always withdrawn. It's not just that an entity can never be identified with its sum total of external relations here and now, as Stephen apparently concedes, but that it may well be the case that many objects exist without currently being in relation to anything at all, and perhaps never will be. Stephen's objection to this is as follows. Deprive me of my relation to oxygen, and I die, but my body persists as a thing, and it interacts with bacteria that is all it needs. Send my dead body into outer space so that it escapes the bacteria and other phenomena of inter interstellar space. His point seems to be that whatever fills the cosmos, it will always have to be involved in some sort of external relations, some efflorescence of networks with other things. But here I think he is wrong. The fact that some kinds of objects, living creatures and perhaps physical things more generally, require some sort of symbiotic network to remain in existence, does not entail that nothing is real apart from such symbiosis. For if there is a sense in, which, sense in which entities are real because they are produced, there is also a sense in which they are produced because they are real. There's time for just one example, and I will suggest the example of speculative realism itself. This group originally consisted of four members, and it can be said to have been born with the email invitations to Grant and Mayasu to join me in Brassier for a workshop the following year. And certainly all four of us existed as individual people prior to that moment, and certainly speculative realism was both solidified and transformed once it was given a name and began to interact more intensely with other entities in its environment. But let's not forget that one of the reasons for the relative success of the group is that Brassier wasn't simply grasping at straws with that particular list of members. He wasn't imposing an arbitrary dictate on the cosmos and creating a group purely ex nihilo, like a Badewian extensive set or a Bonesian catalog or the tour litany of random entities, dolphins, snakes, copper coins, bags of rice, and the Dutch East India Company, for example. Rather, Brassier was responding vaguely to something that pre-existed its name. Just as a painter knows when the lines and colors aren't yet right because the object is already there before it's there on canvas. To summarize, a thing is not real because it is involved in external relations, but can engage in external relations because it is real. It is wrong to say that a thing exists only in the first moment and has an effect. The cosmos is filled, in my view, with sleeping or dormant objects, a very large but finite number of them. We're not talking about abstract possibilities here, but about real objects that simply have not yet made their influence felt, and perhaps never will. With time running out, let's move briefly to anti-smallism. Shaviro and I are in agreement that smallism is a bad idea, and that entities at all levels of scale can be equally real. And despite the claims of Kant's antinomy, that we can never prove one way or the other whether there are final atoms of the world or an infinite regress of smaller and smaller parts, I happen to think we can prove it in favor of the infinite regress. If everything must have internal composition, as I hold, then it is better to defend an infinite regress than to defend a finite regress, like atomism, or no regress at all, as in idealism, in which everything lies at the surface of human access and things have no compositional depth beneath our involvement with them. And this is one of my critiques of Mayasu in my recently completed book about him as well. Stephen Shaviro takes a slightly different approach to the problem. Rather than defending an infinite regress of smaller and smaller entities, he seems to concede that Whitehead's actual entities are the smallest things, but then asserts that the larger societies are not dependent on these smaller things entirely. My question here is to the Whitehead scholars, of which I am not one, being not steeped at all in the lore of the secondary literature, and probably not even exhaustively familiar with some of the primary texts. The question I have is, why is it held that actual entities are microscopic and societies are macroscopic? I'm not sure whether this is even the consensus in Whitehead circles, but it does seem to be every time I dip into the literature. All that is clear from the text, to me at least, is that actual entities perish rather than changing while societies endure. But this does not seem to entail that the perishing things, totally defined by their relations, must only be the tiniest things. At the beginning of the chapter of the categorical scheme, Whitehead introduces actual entities as follows. Actual entities, also termed actual occasions, are the final real things of which the world is made up. There is no going behind actual entities to find anything more real. They differ among themselves. God is an actual entity, and so is the most trivial puff of existence in far off empty space. Notice he says not electrons, but God and trivial puffs of existence in empty space. If Whitehead had intended that actual entities must be the ultra tiny things, he could surely choose a better example than God, who was not microscopic in the least. 
and neither are trivial puffs of existence microscopic. The puff of anything is a certain complex and definite form, however chaotic, and we know that faint puffs of smoke are highly macroscopic in comparison with the various microphysical heroes of physics and its mighty advance across the centuries. And as for the passage about God and trivial puffs of existence, I find nothing later in process and reality to modify this statement, except for Whitehead's caveats that while we can usually use actual entity and actual occasion interchangeably, God should never be called an actual occasion. But this hardly means that God becomes microscopic later in the book. And furthermore, look at the ancestry that Whitehead defines for his term actual entity. The rest vera of Descartes and the substantial power of John Locke, neither of which have anything microscopic about them. And yet I continue to see actual identities, actual entities, identified with the microscopic, both in older authorities such as Donald Sherburne and in younger authors such as Didier Debes and Brussels, whose absence from this conference I deeply regret. But unless convinced otherwise, by someone in this room or elsewhere, that there are compelling reasons to gloss actual entity and society as microscopic and macroscopic respectively, I will continue to interpret them as perishing occasions totally deployed in an instant of satisfaction or complete determination, that's actual entities, and as a relatively durable sequence of slightly different actual entities united by a particular set of eternal objects, that's societies. And so far I see no textual reason not to view everything of every size as characterizable in both ways. In any case, that's what happens in my own philosophy, even if not in white heads. In short, I think Stephen Shavira was wrong to combat smallism only by saying that the tiny doesn't fully determine the macroscopic. I think he should also add that there was no absolute scale of tiny in the first place, but merely a spiraling regress of objects wrapped in objects, sealed in objects, frozen in frozen objects, propped in objects, wedged in objects, pointing downward into a bottomless crevice of ever more objects. Somehow the phrase turtles all the way down is generally taken to be a mighty and crushing objection to any infinite regress of objects. It is seldom noted that those who ridicule this picture are themselves guilty either of worshipping a final, final almighty micro-turtle, that's reductionists, <laughs> or of holding that the world is merely a gigantic turtle show with no turtle underneath, that's the idealists, and even to some extent the correlations. So given that the other alternatives are even more ridiculous, allow me to call for not only for a theory of turtles all the way down, but even of turtles withdrawn from the relations of one another, and therefore incapable of direct, direct contact. But this would open up another front in my ongoing struggle with William Wilson, also known as Stephen Shaviro, and his best life for a different occasion. Well, I now declare this event a free for all. <laughs> and, uh, you're welcome to make comments. I didn't realize that I was your nemesis. <laughs> you get along very well. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm all in the matter of style. So I have a question for Stephen. Um, yeah. During during your talk, you 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 used the um, following words to describe what what things do: thinking, feeling, affectivity, and irresponsibility. And I may have others. So those are the ones I wrote down. Um, and I'm trying to square that with your insistence on on panpsychism over something like experientialism. Um, I can't do it. Can you help me? Um, you mean because those things imply that it should be cool kind of experientialism instead? It's my gut feeling, but, but you seem to have a I know, I, well, again, I'm not sure that those two terms have rigidly different meanings. Sure. I think it's a, it's, it, it's a question of nuance. And I, and I want to insist on the stronger term. Um, but the stronger term well. because, because it is turtles the way down in that sense. Okay. Um, I, I don't know if that's an answer, but, um, okay, I'm going to take another question. Yeah. So you agree with turtles all the way down? I thought you didn't, based on... The well, words. again, I, when you say, okay, when you, when you talk about my critique of smallism, I mean, I have to look more at the text, but it seems to me Whitehead says that, you know, actual entities are in the rest, behind, which, behind them is nothing else which is more essential. So in that sense, they are they are ultimate for him, and you, you're, you're saying in terms of infinite decomposition that nothing's ultimate. Um, so, I mean, I think the difference is that they are ultimate, and societies, societies are not, and therefore I wouldn't equate them in the way you suggested. Um, it may be that you're right that, if God, that God is an actual entity and is not microscopic, though I'm not sure about what I think of the size of the but, um, but again, I, I think the problem, the big thing is why it does say that there's a line with these. I mean, it's important that these ultimate things are not micro particles or even, you know, energy fields necessarily, though he draws metaphorically on 20th century physics, of course. So. He does say that they're the ultimate realities behind which we cannot go. I can imagine Aristotle saying the same thing about primary substance, right? That 
And then I might go there. Yeah. yeah. Well, it could be a whole different scales. And, uh, oh, go ahead. No, I mean, again, my basic feeling about is that, you know, some of the things you say about withdrawal is that, again, I mean, I, I, I don't like the words because they're too easily thrown around as Mayasu throws them around, but that you're, you're hypothesizing, I feel like you're hypothesizing things or, or, or entities when you say that these are, are substances. In other words, I mean, this, if I had more time, I'd go into the whole thing. You have a very interesting argument about panpsychism, and you alluded to it when you said that. Um, you think things are asleep, and in your article in the Scribbins Anthology, you say that only when things are relating to other things are they thinking, and when they're asleep, they're, they're not thinking, therefore you're not quite a panpsychist. Well, that, I'm correctly paraphrasing you. Yeah. Okay, well again, so I don't really think anything is ever really asleep, or I think when we're asleep, there, there, are, thing, there, there are still things going on, and therefore we are, there, there still is. There still is. And your objection to my use of substance, this is our exchange in the book, so yeah. is that you think uh, coming is primary, and to call it a substance is sorry, hypostatization. I see that as no problem, as you know. I think the problem, the only problem with traditional substance is the natural kind aspect of it. Yeah, also, well, again, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. That's a, I lost my... Okay, it's just, I, I, yeah, that, I mean... Again, I'm not sure, I don't see anything gained by calling, the, I mean, you could say, well, what Whitehead calls actual entities are really substances in a certain way. I'm not, I don't see anything gained by saying that, and I see some potential confusion. I mean, precisely because actual entities are finite atomistic things which perish as soon as, 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 soon as they are fulfilled. I mean, it has to do, I mean, things, I, I, we, um, Michael talked yesterday about preferring things to uh, objects that I do too, and I'm not sure I have firm grounds for the rhetorical preference, but again, um, things I think are societies, and they do endure, but I mean, again, the freedom of an actual entity is connected to its finitude, to the fact that it, it however, it's it has all these relations, and that's the material it uses, but it does select and, and, and choose among them, and thus adds to the multiplicity of the universe, it adds what, you know, I mean, the world becomes one and is increased by one. So it becomes one is where the internal relations go to think, but it's increased by one because it creates something which didn't exist before. So that's you know that's that's decision, freedom, novelty, which as I tried to point out is for Whitehead professionally says that against my melodramatic sense of what it means can actually be seen as a rather banal everyday actuality. Um, but again, that's it, it seems to me that that is there's something added for when you, when you say substance, and that's why again, in your article on panpsychism, you reject the idea about an inside. Right? You reject Russell's idea and the inside rather uh, the outside. The inside is not enough for you because inside something is still withdrawn from its own relations and so on and so forth. And I'm not sure I see the necessity of it. I think it adds a lot of baggage, which I don't find at all helpful. Um, I, and again, I think this may go back to the different metaphysical cravings which you and I have. Let, let me just say one word about the terminological use of objects and things. Yeah. What, one thing is that I've always simply, I've, I've grown tired of Heidegger's somewhat pedantic distinction between yeah. the two, where thing is always a positive term and, and object and negative. I think the reason I prefer object is partly because I want to link up to that Austrian tradition, which includes Husserl mm -hmm. as well as Meinong and Zbardowski, which yeah. I find very powerful, uh, but Tom to some extent also. Uh, but also, for me, there are two kinds of objects, of course, the sensual and the mm -hmm. real, and you can't use the term thing for both of those, where you, whereas you can use the term objects both for real objects hiding outside and for the intentional well, objects that just for also. Yeah, no, I understand. I mean, that's my, if I prefer things, it's precisely because it seems to me that you can talk about the inside and outside rather than have the real object be something separate from the central object. It's just the inside. For me, it's just the inside and the outside of, 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 of things. And that's, you know, I think where we dis disagree, and I know what you said in the panpsych, in your panpsych and all that, that you don't think the inside qualifies. But I'm not, you know, for me, when you get down to the level of actual entities, it, it, it does qualify. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know, I just want to ask about um, your reliance on your description of the microcosmic and the macrocosmic. Right. I mean, it's, uh, in a sense, it's not an important term for Whitehead, as I understand it. Which term? Uh, microcosmic and macrocosmic. No, it's not, but the commentators bring this in. Yeah, okay, well, um, probably don't have to. So, um, but as you were saying, that, that that's one of your main points of disagreement, is actually another way of putting it, which Chip talked about, and which Stephen directly talked about, is the public and the private. Uh, 
I suppose my worry is that, in a strange way, you're, you're maybe not taking the challenge that Whitehead is making, um, the, the peculiarity of it. You're not recognizing the peculiarity of what he's saying. He's using, when he says microcosmic, uh, microcosmic, microcosmic, he's also, it's the same stuff that he's talking about, which he's trying to get up with public and private. Um, and when you're talking, uh, you talked about from page 59, uh, it's actually the same thing uh, it's the, when he's talking about John Locke and the and real internal constitution of an entity. And it's not a question of external and internal relations. It's, these aren't things which we can map onto that. Um, it's actually more to do with what he refers to more, which is the formal constitution of the entity, which, if we just say that's its internal relations, which it, it's, it is really <coughs> a process, I would say. I haven't put this very well in of the process of the formal constitution becoming what he calls objective A, or becoming objective. So the object comes out of the formal constitution of the... I know you're shaking your head at me, which is putting me off. Well, because um, you, <laughs> asked me, because you <laughs> also get an unfair advantage because you have a book right behind you. I have one, one passage to say. I'm not sure we can uh, solve that without my having a good plan. Okay, right. Um, but, I mean, it really is the, the, the public private is a much nicer way of putting it involved in the... Because if you say microcosmic and macrocosmic, we've already got into questions of small and small amounts. I didn't talk about microcosmic and macrocosmic, I talked about microscopic and macroscopic. Mi sorry, I'm saying... A microscopic... Oh, right, okay, right, right, okay. Um, yes, yeah, so that part of my question was wrong. <laughs> so the second part about the public and the private, which is, I think, the more interesting aspect, which relates to page 59, the formal constitution of the real the real internal constitution, the formal constitution, which gets from John Locke. It's a very peculiar, it's a peculiarity, I think, which links to the notion of the public and the private. Okay, but the question is whether the concept of private here is good enough to do the work that I'm having objects do, real objects do. And I don't think it does, because on Stephen's blog post, for example, he finds that private is being has the best subjective aim, and the, the problem with me is even when it's private, it's still defined by apprehensions. And so the hot potato is being passed back. Where's the thing ever real? You, every, wherever you go, it's always going to be defined by its relation to other things. Where's the reality? It's what it does with that relation so that makes it real, and that's done in, in privacy. I mean, it's when that's why the, the entity is not a substance because it's something that it's a, it's a becoming that is that is finite and done with. So I mean, it's and it, it's then it becomes another you know datum for other. But in my opinion, you make it too easy for it to cross that membrane, as you call it, between private and public. I think that's an insuperable gap. Because uh, no presence of a thing, no amount of present relations to a thing are ever going to add up to that thing. You know well, that, I mean, that, uh, this is something I didn't get into in, the, in my talk, but again, it's, I mean, it, that's, that's too kind of cognitive, cognitive way for me. I think feeling things is different from cognizing them. And you know, you mentioned that a little, and that also came in to Michael, Michael's right. talk this, this afternoon about. I'm not sure I would endorse the shelling as relayed by Michael, since I don't know shelling well enough to know. But that it's physical as opposed to knowledge. I don't think it's it's more physical than it's mental. I think it's both. But as but it's it has to do with an aspect aspect of mentality which is not cognitive and which um, is not reducible to those. To those terms, and that's where I mean. So that directly links into what I'm saying about panpsychism. That it's 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 a decision um, which involves selection, involves you know positive and negative apprehensions. And uh, what you remarked, what was it this, this morning in one of the question sessions that um, you that white as a negative attention still leave, still leaves a mark, whereas for you it's completely yes, devoid. But I mean that's more complicated because. That's true of, pre pre of negative apprehensions of other entities. It's not true of negative apprehensions of eternal objects, which can be, he says, can be totally absent. But that, I, I haven't gotten to that because, you know, I mean, Whitehead has very complex requisites, and that leads to uh, this, this dimension of, you know, of causal efficacy versus and presentational immediacy and the freedom of the entity in relation to other entities. And then there's the other dimension, which seems to be irreducible to that, which has to do with eternal objects, and that seems important to me. I, it's not in the model I was working out here. My, I abstracted away from it for for what I was saying tonight, and I obviously have to bring it back, but I don't think that would negate what I'm arguing in this particular case. 
about, you know. Do you want to do My question is uh, for Stephen, and it's, it's a two-part question. The second part depends on the answer to the first. And okay. that is, is there any sense in which feeling or thinking has priority over the other for you? Um, well, I think it's a terminological matter rather than a substantive matter. I think f thinking is, I think feeling is the primordial form of thinking for Whitehead. And other forms of thinking which are often used in more, in, in, in more, um, in other terms, are really derivative of that and, you know, generated out of that. So in a certain sense, the analytic panpsych is the right to say that, you know, thinking couldn't come and the radical emergence of all the thinking that I mean, Galen Storzman is a long thing about how the emergence of water from individual molecules which don't have properties of wetness is explicable. And he even says the emergence of life from non living matter is explicable, but the emergence of consciousness from, from non conscious things, he says, is inexplicable. And again, I think he's thinking of consciousness too much. I think there's, if you accept the thought, I'm not sure it's unconscious in either the Schelling yes, but the Freudian sense, but that, but, but feeling which precedes consciousness. When the quote I had in it says it may be conscious or not, it may, but, but it involves an adversion or aversion, which is so that's primordial feeling, as thought as feeling for me. Yeah, so my question was specifically just about the white and the notion of the actual. So just with respect to actual occasions, actual entities, whichever term. You well, again, I mean, this has to do with. Is there any reason to prefer one over the other? Entity or occasion in terminology? No, no, no. no. Feeling, it's mental pull versus it's physical pull. I think the same thing, but his feeling has to, I mean, he talks about conceptual feelings have to do with conceptual apprehensions, and there are different degrees to which they actually consider alternatives. The lowest degree for white is when something just repeats what it, what it apprehends. And, uh, and, you know, but I think, again, it's, but there's no rigid ontological boundary at what point. It's always, I mean, he always says certain things are negligible rather than actually inexistent. Yeah, I guess my, my purpose for asking is, yeah. it seems to me that the panpsychism Especially in your terminology, towards the end of your paper, yeah. you started to privilege the term feeling even more. Yeah. And it seems to me you've got both working together, and it's hard for me to see why um, the advantage of privileging and side is more experiential. I, I think I, I think that's really a rhetorical question rather than a substantive question. I think they, if you, I think ultimately they can mean pretty much the same thing, and um, I think panpsychism is a kind of when it's stronger, less windy, I mean, more <laughs> confrontational kind, kind of term. I mean, I'm not, you know, I don't think, I'm not, I don't mean to disrespect David Ray Griffin, it's just, I mean, I just find it for various reasons, which have to do with the kind of things I talk about, also the science fiction I was referring to at the beginning and as, which I, since I often try to frame this as by thinking of science fiction as tools for thought, it seems to me the term which does better work, but I'm not sure it's really definitionally different. Scavina also broadens the term to yeah. all kinds of things, cognition, perception, feeling. So it's rather read Scavina's book, Panpsychism in the West, really ought to. It's a wonderful survey of how deeply intertwined Western philosophy, let alone Eastern, Western yeah. philosophy is with panpsychism. So I haven't even thought of this, how, how ubiquitous it is throughout the tradition. Yeah, that's one of the main major really takeaways from it. I mean, I should mention both Scavina's books, so the other one is unfortunately unconsciously expensive. But I mean, I'm oh, good. Good. oh, good. Which has articles by Graham and by um, speculative Lewis Ian Hamilton Grant, as well as by Galen Storrs and Sam Pullman and other analytic philosophers I mentioned, and and and, and, and you know has a wide it has a wide range of perspectives of contemporary panpsychism. It's what's a good mind that abides. It's also I think, a very good book. I'm going to uh, allow us to run on till uh, half past eight. Uh, Scrub uh, Dan is in full session. And the next question is from Clinton Booth. Okay. Yeah, since we've already talked about what David Ray Griffin came to the room, and Graham asked a question about the microscopic angle. Um, I might be able to give you one answer to how actual occasions are not always smaller than society. So, to describe what's going on in the human being, there are actual occasions that there's society that will have to be able to earn some part. But when I'm aware of what happened at one moment of my present moment of experience, that is also an application, which is bigger than all the society. So we have kind of later. And then 
So that one moment of my experience is a bigger actual occasion than the one in the body. But those actual occasions of my experience are also in society, which is the soul. But then if you combine my soul, which is the society, and the awareness of my soul and body together is another actual occasion compounded. So at least in Britain's view, we have these layers, microscopic, macroscopic, Maybe I should say it's actual occasion, society, actual occasion, determined to push one side of that. Yeah, I mean, I have, I have no problem with that as long as it's not hierarchical. As I said, I mean, you know, Whitehead says that, you know, he doesn't say that it's, he talks about a stone reciting his autobiography. At another point, he complains about theories of the soul, which say that it endures. And we, we ask for, you know, a vital principle and said we were told that the soul is like a stone. So, I mean, Whitehead, to some extent, does this stones, but I don't think it's, a, as I was saying before, I don't think it's a fundamental ontological difference. There are differences in the degree, but they're not, they're, that doesn't contradict the ontological similarity. In that sense, I, what, what you summarize, it, it seems perfectly acceptable to me, as long as it doesn't become a rigid hierarchy. And again, Whitehead often talks about how, you know, there's a governing, there's a governing occasion in animals, and there isn't one in plants, and so on and so forth. Again, I, I don't see those as, I see those as derivative rather than as basic statements and ones which maybe, you know, with recent scientific discussion about plant, the sensibility of plants and, well, and things that might have to be modified in some way. But I mean, again, plants, plants are democracies and animals are dictatorships. So he doesn't use the term dictatorship, what it sort of says. Again, I, I'm not sure of the d details of that, but I, I think those are derivative statements within a general ontological argument and, and non ontological argument. I brought it up in relation to small. Yeah, no, 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 I, I, yeah, no, I, I accept, I, I accept that. But I mean, I think the important thing for, as far as small is concerned, is that Whitehead does not say that ultimate, that that ultimate entities therefore are more real than, than societies composed of those entities. Nor are they necessarily kind. Yeah, I'm, I'm willing, I'm willing to accept that, and as a modification, what I'm saying, and. I'd still say that this is constant with saying that Whitehead rejects smallism as common in this common concept. Do you agree with that? Yeah. Well, I have to revise my uh, earlier declaration. We have five minutes left, so that is still ten parts. Mm -hmm. And we have, still have a number of questions. The next one is from June the Chair. Um, yeah, I, I would pick up on this. I think the smallism is a misnomer. Um, uh, it, it's it's not one that one that doesn't sort of um, stumble into, but I, I think associating entities, even if we take them microscopically, and he does use that language, <coughs> as having size is a mistake. Right? Mm -hmm. you know, in any of the, the yeah. usual sense of meaning mm -hmm. by size, because uh, I think we're dealing with a different principle of individuation here than any of the ones that apply to things with what we call size. Mm -hmm. um, however, he does use this microscopic language. And there's, um, just as a point of reference, I'm thinking too scholastic, there's that really interesting editor's note about this microscopic, microcosmic, micro, micro, macroscopic, macrocosmic question mm -hmm. about what the text should say. And, and they note that, that what had, you know, adds in a footnote for the publication about his doctrine of microscopic atomic occasions, mm -hmm. you know, labeling it that yeah. quite consciously. Um, and he does talk about the kinds of fundamental real things that are in contrast to large-scale enduring objects, you know, and he calls those macroscopic objects. However, I think the text also sustains a reading like, like Wallace years ago, that, that actual entity is, is a, an analytic category that applies across mm -hmm. any scale, um, to which we might want to, or, or from which we might want to scrutinize things, things in, in a more generic sense. Um, and I think he is simply, there's a, 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 an irresolvable tension in the text as it is, as to which mind Whitehead is of. <laughs> That's a terrible sentence, but you know. <laughs> um, that there's both, it. actual entity operates at all kinds of analytic levels, and it's this microscopic relationship compared to enduring objects. And I, and I think 
while I've, I've sort of bemoaned this, you know, for, for years and years myself, I, I think that may be the most provocative thing he leaves mm -hmm. us with, that the, the contrast of those two options as to how to take entities is what leaves us room to do that physics in a sense. Yeah. Well, since, uh, yeah, since you know the secondary literature so well on Whitehead in a way that I don't, you, you mentioned Wallach. How lonely a figure is Wallach? You talk about an irresolvable tension here, but it sounds like the majority is on the other Yeah, oh, uh, Wallach kind of drifted away from process stuff after being so soundly rejected. Right. And, you know, I, I was taken aside at a conference with another graduate student saying uh, to, um, I don't want to say who I said to, <laughs> um, you know, one of the old guard, and I said, I really you know, find the Wallach's thesis provocative, and they said, oh, forget Wallach. You know, and, and that's basically what they tried to do. Um, but I, I think, you know, time, every time I undertake to study what I graduate students, they're quite drawn to that reading. I think it, it, it held up better than some of the other sort of more scholastic readings. I know, I'll have to look. No, thanks. That's very helpful. I don't have to look at Wallach, who I've never looked at. But um, the other thing which strikes me about this, uh, you know, whole question of size has to do with the fact that Whitehead, like Leibniz against Newton and Clark, insists not that we don't have a pre existing matrix of time and space, but it's in fact these actual entities which generate temporality and spatiality. So the finite becoming, which in some cases is related to the species present of the actual entity is nonetheless what generates time space time rather than what is already located in a matrix of space time. So so size probably has to be thought about in that in that context. If I could be allowed one comment, Bradford Wallach's book was a MA thesis at the Memorial University of Utah. Uh, the next question is Nathan Brown. Um, question for Graham. Um, just for my own Application because I think I should probably like, know the answer. I don't, I don't know. I don't know how you um, put it in this context. Um, there's a question about a uh, process in Whitehead um, in relation to infinite regress um, in triple O. And it's just um, like I've cited this passage already before today, I guess. Um, that Whitehead says the community of uh, all things, actual things, is an incompletion in the process of production. Um, and so, the community of all things is an incompletion, right? It's incomplete by virtue of this process, I suppose. Um, and what I'm wondering is, uh, so you have an infinite regress in your philosophy of objects all the way up, all the way down, et cetera, you went through. Not all the way up, but all the way down, yes. Yeah. Sorry. Not all the way up, but this, there's always going to be a top layer of dormant objects that are not in further relations. So it's a, it's a finite progress, but it's an infinite regress. Yes, because to, to say that there's an infinite progress upwards would mean that things keep entering into further relations and composing new objects. And that doesn't happen in my opinion. Because there's always so going to be a because now my question is just like, well, so how is that foreclosed in terms of like, uh, like how do you delimit that in terms of um, thinking of a totality or something? Like, where do you, by what principle would you delimit that in your The principle is that. Uh, all objects, <laughs> there are compositional relations that do not have a final layer. But what makes composition is two objects interact to form a new object. And it's never going to be the case that, that all objects keep interacting with other objects to create ever larger ones, because there are objects that I call dominant objects, which are not in any relation at all. Right? They simply are what they are. They might be someday in a relation, they might not, but that's the top layer. So what's the metal object? <laughs> there is none. There's no universe. 